Good. Well, I'm, I'm Sheila Bond, and on behalf of the John Nicholas Brown Center for Public Humanities and the Department of History of Art and Architecture, I want to welcome everyone to this joint uh, roundtable. And I'm going to turn things over in the interest of time in a moment to uh, Professor Neumann. Uh, but first, let me say that we'll have questions and answers at the end. And if you will, if you have a question, introduce yourself first to the speaker when you pose your question, but that will be at the end. And now uh, Dietrich Neumann will um, introduce our speaker. Yes, it's really a, a particular pleasure to introduce Divya Rao Hefley, who is the Associate Director of the Office of Public Art in Pittsburgh. The reason why it's a particular pleasure is that, uh, of course, all of us in art history, uh, at least among the faculty, not necessarily the grad students, but of course, remember her very fondly from her time here at Brown. And uh, uh, just very quickly to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, Divya, she went to Yale for her undergraduate studies in history of art and then worked for Weissman Frady uh, in New York and then the Carnegie Museum already for a first stint. And then she came to uh, Brown and joined us here and wrote a, an amazingly wonderful PhD thesis, really innovative about space-time notations in architecture and urban experiences. One of those unexplored, uh, really exciting topics. And, and she allowed the whole thesis to be online. So if you're interested in how uh, architects and urban planners in the 50s and 60s engaged with space-time notations to in fact somehow capture what they saw when they moved through urban uh, spaces, you can download her entire thesis and, and read it. It's, it's truly fantastic. But I wanted to point out that when I looked at her CV while she was at Brown, I feel you put pieces of a puzzle together that lead towards your, uh, your future uh, profession because I noticed you worked for the artist Dickie Fleischner who many of us of course know uh, and, and are very fond of uh, uh, for two years. You worked at RISD, uh, the museum at RISD, you worked for the Bell Gallery and you taught your own class uh, about urbanism and so I see elements of public art and urban environments uh, sort of coming together here and then of course uh, when you were when you were finished here, you went to the um, Carnegie Museum and very quickly uh, went up through the ranks to become senior program manager and senior manager of engagement and strategy. And then you moved on to the Office of Public Art in Pittsburgh, where you oversee collaboration with artists and sponsor them and make their artworks uh, uh, possible in the public realm. And in the meantime, you've published quite widely long range of articles and you're on, on a number of boards that deal with public art and uh, uh, interventions in public space. So it's really wonderful to see you, Divya. We were just thinking, I think we haven't seen each other in, in real life in about 10 years, which is exactly uh, the time that has passed since you graduated. So uh, very happy and very excited to hear your talk. So please uh, join me all in virtually welcoming Divya Rao Hefley. Thank you so much, Dietrich, for that very, very kind introduction. Um, and hello and good afternoon, everybody. It's so nice to see so many familiar faces and, and so many faces that I have yet to meet and hopefully we'll get a chance to meet um, virtually today and hopefully in person in the future. Um, so I, I wanted to thank, uh, start by thanking you, Dietrich, as well as Sheila and Evie for inviting me here today, as well as Nancy and Sabina and Marissa for helping me set all of this up. It really is such an honor to be back at Brown, at least virtually, and speaking at this roundtable. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to note that uh, due to the current circumstances, I'm currently sharing a house with multiple children, all of whom are on their lunch break right now. So. I thank you in advance for your patience. If we uh, have any unexpected interruptions, I will do my best to minimize them. All right, so today I'd like to start by sharing the work that we do at the Office of Public Art. And after a brief introduction and overview, I'll focus the majority of this roundtable on our civically engaged public art program. This program is grounded in equity and social justice and centers collaborations with communities that have been historically underrepresented and marginalized in civic processes. So I'll present roughly 10 projects from the past four years, including the ones you see here on this screen by artists creating and co-creating work with communities. You'll hear about these collaborations as well as the OPA processes and structures that have been integral to nurturing them and ensuring that they succeed. Okay, first, let's set the stage. 
The Office of Public Art, or OPA for short, is located within the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council, and we serve the 13 county region of southwestern Pennsylvania. To further clarify, we're not part of city government, we're entirely private. However, when we were originally founded in 2005, it was as a public-private partnership between the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council and the City of Pittsburgh's Department of City Planning, back when the city lacked its own public art staff. Several years ago, the city created a division of public art and civic design, which allowed us to move completely into the private sector and commission our own work and projects across the board. Now, I should mention here that because we don't own our own land or property, these commissions take the form of either temporary public art or artist residencies. And while we're practiced in helping others commission permanent works of art, we don't commission them ourselves. Permanent works require a whole slew of other policies, collections management, maintenance programs, decommissioning policies, and other mechanisms that we're just not in a position to undertake. So, the Arts Council serves as our fiscal sponsor, and we're still able to collaborate with the city on projects, so we feel we're in a really good place. Our work at OPA is guided by the following core principles. Artists are agents of social, civic, and cultural change, and we support them to work with communities. That community members are highly valued collaborators with expertise in their neighborhoods. We build capacity for them to engage with artists. Equity and social justice are the foundation of our work. We center equitable and just practices through staff commitments, as well as in our programs, partnerships, and collaborations. And a successful public art landscape depends upon a thriving network of public art practitioners. As part of our work, we build tools and systems to support the public art ecosystem in the region. Now, we believe that art in the public realm has the potential to significantly impact the social and civic life of the communities in which it's based. To that end, we support the creation of public art that centers the voices of these communities, as well as the vision of its makers, and believe that art created with these intentions can both build community and increase social connection. Which leads right into our mission and vision statement. We envision a region in which the creative practices of artists are fully engaged to collaboratively shape the public realm and catalyze community-led change. We build capacity for this work through civically engaged public art, artist resources, public programming, and technical assistance. Although I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about our other program areas, I did wanna note that we support artists and communities in many different ways. We have a robust artist resources program for both emerging and established artists that prepares artists to make work in the public realm through training series, workshops, hands-on assistance, and tool building opportunities. We also run an extensive public programming series that has had to pivot during COVID, but includes walking tours, artist-led tours, studio visits, and panel discussions designed for artists and members of the general public alike. We also offer technical assistance to clients and developers who are interested in commissioning or collaborating with artists to integrate artworks or artist design building elements into new projects or renovations. But today, as I mentioned, I'm focusing primarily on our civically engaged public art program. So in my role as associate director, I'm on the leadership team of the office, assisting with strategic direction, advisory board relationships, operations, and grant writing but a big part of my time is devoted to stewarding this program area. Now, I've already said that civically engaged public art is grounded in equity and social justice and centers collaborations with communities that have been historically marginalized or underrepresented in civic processes. But how is civic engagement achieved? Well, it's about intention and process. How is the public intentionally engaged in the process of creating or co-creating the work? The projects I'm going to share with you today engage with the people and place of a community to create work that speaks to both the artist's vision and the community's needs. They stretch across media and discipline and challenge what may be called traditional notions of public art, going far beyond murals and sculptures, which are most commonly associated with art in the public realm. These artists share a common focus on putting people and place first. Like historians, perhaps, they excavate through layers to gain a better understanding of the context. They address questions like, what's the history of the neighborhood or community in which they're working? 
what may have happened before or is still happening today that may not be accurately captured, if captured at all, in the historic record. How is this place tied to community identity, and in what ways has the environment perhaps challenged community resilience? Also, which people will be most impacted by their work? How can they be best engaged in the process of creation? And how can trust and relationships be cultivated throughout the process? These artists also question the distinction between history and memory. Whose stories are in the historic record? Who had the power and privilege to speak, be recorded, and be listened to? How can the stories or memories otherwise missing from the historic record be amplified or lifted up through their artwork? Now, I hope as you listen to this roundtable, you'll think about some of these questions yourselves. How can we challenge oppressive structures created through systemic and structural racism, sexism, and white supremacy to amplify and lift up marginalized stories or histories? We may have a, a different set of tools at our disposal than these artists, but we have equal agency and I might add urgency to uncover and lift up marginalized narratives, which the canon of history may have overlooked or ignored. All right, with these prompts, let's begin. The first two projects I'd like to talk about are Homecoming Hill District, Hill District USA by artist in Jamie and Jai and Larmer Stories by artist John Pena. Both of these artworks are part of an initiative that OPA launched in 2015 called the Temporary Public Art and Placemaking Program. This pilot program was a collaboration between OPA and Neighborhood Allies, a community development organization that makes and supports neighborhood-based investments to help transform vulnerable communities and identify scalable ways to create positive social impact. The goal of this program was to support six artists to collaborate with six community-based organizations that served residents within neighborhood allies target neighborhoods. These neighborhoods were identified as the six most distressed and or transitional in the region across a variety of economic, social, and health-based indicators. Now this project, like almost all civically uh, engaged public programs that we run, follows a structured and facilitated OPA process. The process began with an open call for organizational partners that we actively promoted and circulated for about two months. Then a panel of project staff and outside arts professionals selected the final six organizations based on the applications they submitted to the call as well as follow-up in-person interviews, a process which usually takes another two months. After the organizations were on board, we worked closely with them to write and distribute the call for artists and then manage the artist selection process. The artists were selected by another panel, this time of representatives from the selected organizations, as well as some outside arts professionals based again on applications and interviews. The call for artists, like the call for organizations, circulated for two months, um, with artist selection taking another two months, bringing the selection and onboarding portion of our process up to about eight to 10 months. Now at that point, a project manager from OPA was assigned to each of the six pairings to help facilitate the following two phases. In the next phase, the one colored yellow on screen, the artists learned about the communities in which they were working and proposed both a community engagement strategy and an initial idea for the project. Now this phase can take anywhere between four and 12 months, depending on the type of program and its unique needs and funding. During the last phase, the implementation phase, which is scheduled to take roughly a year, the artists collaborated with residents and their community organization to create and implement their art projects. Here's a quick look at the same six again, and you can see just by looking at the screen that each of these works took a very different form and aspect. There are sculptures, glass mosaics, photo murals, and social practice works. Each one was developed within the unique conditions and addressed the unique needs of the community organization. In other words, each work was grounded in the context of the place and people in question. So the Hill District partnership was between artists and Jamie and Jai and the Hill House Association and resulted in Homecoming, Hill District USA, a series of four digitally montaged photo murals installed on locations across the neighborhood. Now, by way of background, the Hill is immediately adjacent to downtown Pittsburgh and has historically been home to residents of many ethnicities, many of whom have been immigrants. In the 20th century with the Great Migration, the Hill became a thriving black community and business district, also known as one of the jazz capitals of the world. In the mid 20th century, 
28 acres of a lower hill were raised as a result of urban renewal to make way for a civic center, forcing the dislocation of 8,000 people from the neighborhood. Now, this history is the one most commonly told about the Hill District. And Jamie, who identifies as both a Black artist and native Pittsburgher, wanting to dig, wanted to dig deeper into that narrative and excavate what she called the everyday slice of life stories to tell a more holistic history of the neighborhood. So she began by conducting a series of informal interviews to better understand how residents felt about their neighborhood. During these initial conversations, she discovered the, that the residents wanted to see documentation that recognized authentic and positive stories from the neighborhood. She gathered oral histories and photographs, researched in libraries and archives, and kept coming back to a single theme that extended throughout these stories of the hill, and that was the idea of home. For the Vanguard, her first installation in the Hill District, and Jamie decided to design a fictional sitting room. She chose the side wall of the childhood home of famed playwright August Wilson, focusing on the outline of the house that was once adjacent to it, as you can see on the left. She set the stage with a floral wallpaper pattern that kept appearing over and over to her in the photographs that were being shared with her by residents, as well as in some of her family's own photographs. She began layering in the figures she was encountering through her research and adding in people from the contemporary photos that she was taking. In effect, she created a fictional gathering that could never have occurred in reality, that yet opened up space to imagine conversations across space and time, collapsing past and present history and memory, and stitching together a story of the Hill District as home that stretched across the decades. Here you can see in Jamie with Terry Baltimore, who was the organizational representative for the Hill House Association, standing in front of the installation, The Beat Keepers. This installation recognizes the artists of the Hill District, both past and present, who have kept the beat of the neighborhood. Now, along the back of this installation are grabs of newspaper articles that told one type of history of the Hill in the 20th century, which was then activated by the artists in the foreground with their own lived histories and experiences. This next breathtaking installation called The Village lives on the steps, lives, lives currently, it was recently uh, refurbished, on the steps of the Kaufman Auditorium, right next door to where the Hill House Association was located. This installation celebrates the diversity of the Hill District residents who have made the neighborhood what it is today. In the anchors installed on the side of a community space, and Jamie pays respects to the elders of the Hill District. The installation is reminiscent of a porch common in the neighborhood. Men play chess on the left while the women on the right, as in Jamie describes, are both looking out on the hill, but also looking out for the hill, keeping the neighborhood together over time. Over the course of her process and installations, she amassed an enormous archive of information. She organized many of the 50 interviews she had done by theme and created a website where the stories live on, presented alongside the photographs shared by her interviewees. She also built a digital interactive map that you can see on the right that offers more of a spatial journey through the material she gathered. Now, if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to visit her website at hillhomecoming.com. The Larimer partnership was between artist John Pena and the Larimer Consensus Group, or LCG. John began not knowing anything about the neighborhood, so started by doing paid one-on-one -on -one interviews, recording personal stories of long-term Larimer residents. He realized he was interviewing some of the same people over and over, most often the senior residents of the community, who both had a lot of stories to share and more time to spend sharing. This inspired him to organize a senior luncheon along with the LCG, where participants were asked to select the quotes from John's interviews that they felt best represented the experiences of Larmer residents. In trying to figure out how best to share the stories, John and what became the Larmer Seniors Group decided on a metal display structure with pop-out letters right on the corner in front of LCG's building. The display changed once every two weeks with John's original question in a word balloon and the corresponding answer from the interviews on the structure. The goal was to start building a collective and more informal history of the neighborhood, told from the point of view of its residents. Here you can see a photo of John in blue plaid and all the seniors at the opening on the left, and on the right, one of the first questions and answers. Can you tell me something about Orphan Street? People used to grow grapes on the hillside of Orphan, 
That's why Negley Run was called Chianti Street. Now you see that the quote is attributed to the Larmer Seniors Group, 500 plus years living in Larmer. This is because none of the seniors wanted to be named in person. So they came up with this strategy that honors the collective age of everyone in the group and maintains their anonymity. Now, because the display structure only had a certain amount of room for text, some of the answers had to be broken apart and shared slowly over the course of weeks or even months, creating a conversational narrative that allowed the history of Larimer and the residents' perspectives to unfold slowly over time. How long have you lived in Larimer? All my life. I was born here on Mayflower Street in 1919. Two weeks later, whoa, how old does that make you? I'm 98 years old. I grew up here during the depression and I was drafted into World War II, one of two. Again, another two weeks later. I was married for 70 years, had three kids and worked as a mail carrier for 60 years. Now you can see the one of two, two of two convention being used here. John used to joke, joke with the seniors that what they were actually doing was a very slow tweeting, which they all got a really big kick out of. Now I won't read this one out, but I love this slide because it really shows how the conversation existed not just in space, but across time. The same prompt stretches over two months and two seasons. So John's sign remained up for just over a year, at which point John realized he wanted to continue and extend his engagement with, engagement with the senior group. Thanks to some additional funding, he's been working in more of an artist in residence capacity for the past couple of years with 15 senior citizens in Larimer using an art space practice to broaden the conversation around aging. Now, although I don't have time to go into it here, his work with them has been instrumental in building connections and helping them deal with the immense challenges of isolation during this pandemic. All right. Now I'm going to turn to a program that's currently in process. One year after the temporary public art and placemaking program concluded, we received funding from the NEA's Our Town program to launch a second round of this program alongside neighborhood allies and their neighboring borough of Millvale, PA. While we were in the process of program development, the COVID-19 pandemic struck. We saw how our region's most vulnerable communities were at greatest risk from both the virus itself and the isolating impacts of quarantine. We believe that arts and culture projects and programs can play a powerful role in addressing some of these needs. This approach was informed by the cross-sector collaborations of Art Place America with the Center for Arts and Medicine at the University of Florida. This white paper on the left was drafted by an interdisciplinary group working at the intersections of public health, arts and culture, and community development in 2017, long before the pandemic. It's part of a 10 year effort by Art Place America to position arts and culture as a core sector of community planning and development in order to achieve equitable, healthy and sustainable communities in which all residents have a voice and agency. This call for collaboration on the right is a much more recent adaptation of that white paper that shows how its core principles can be put into action. And so following this model, PAC was designed to support artists and communities and working together to respond to COVID-19 and the many intersecting public health crises that have only been magnified by this pandemic. Between this year and the next, four artists will collaborate with four community-based organizational partners to create four works of temporary public art in Pittsburgh communities. By supporting artists to collaborate with communities, we hope to enhance connection, coping, and well-being, and create new tools for addressing community-defined challenges. The process will focus on building place-based strategies that respond to the immediate context of the community based in the place, the people, and their unique circumstances. Creative placemaking will be at the center of the work, which, like place-based strategies, is closely tied to a specific place. As Jamie Hand at Art Place America describes, in creative placemaking, art plays an intentional and integrated role in place-based community planning and development and invites artists and arts organizations to join their neighbors as collaborators in community development that must be locally informed, human-centered, and holistic. To help us develop this program and our call for organizations, we convene the Public Health and Public Art Advisory Group composed of leaders in public health, community development, and environmental and social justice. 
in the call for collaborate in the call for organizations, applicants were asked to identify their specific public health issue as a focus point for collaboration with an artist. These partnering organizations were ultimately selected through our process. Each will be focusing on a specific issue from black mental health and racism to food insecurity and social isolation or a combination of some of those and all, or all of them. We recently released the call for artists for this program, which is open to artists across the country. So if you know anyone who might be interested, please do direct them to our website. Shifting back now into some completed projects, I wanted to talk next about some of our artist residencies in the public realm. Our artist residencies always begin like our temporary public art and placemaking program as a partnership with community-based organizations and without preconceived notions of a project outcome. In 2017, we launched four artist residencies in the public realm with immigrant and refugee community organizations, a partnership with the city's welcoming, welcoming Pittsburgh office, intended to help newcomers connect with the city and its residents. Now, our artist residencies are usually longer term initiatives with engagement and implementation stretching an average of two years. During this time, four artists deeply engaged with four community-based partnering organizations serving immigrants and refugees. In the first year, the artists engaged with their organization stakeholders and community members to build relationships, understand challenges, and collaboratively identify needs in the community. In the second year, the artists and organizations learned how to work together to develop a collaborative creative project based on the first year of learning and engagement. In this project, artist Mary Tremonti partnered with Literacy Pittsburgh. As the host organization, Literacy Pittsburgh's goal was to develop a sense of community between their students, many of whom are English as second language learners, and connection with the American world around them. Mary collaborated with the staff and students from 2017 to 19 to design and implement Where Are You Going? Where Have You Been? This temporary public artwork was featured on public buses throughout the Pittsburgh area. Tremonti's sketches of the students appeared alongside quotes recounting their experiences of arriving in Pittsburgh and learning how to access the city around them. The quotes themselves were sourced from interviews that the students conducted with each other, which was integrated into their lessons as a way to practice English. She also developed arts-based lessons to complement Literacy Pittsburgh's ESL teaching and launched a collaborative process with the students in family literacy classes. She took the students to a local neighborhood print shop in Braddock where they designed and screen printed wallpaper and fabric for curtains, which were ultimately used to refurbish a room at Literacy Pittsburgh, as you can see on the right. Mary's arts-based lessons engaged students who were seeking to learn English, but who had little or no language schooling at home. These hands-on activities offered opportunities for students to build on their progress, as well as motivation to learn English in new ways. Part of the same set of residencies, playwright and artist Molly Rice collaborated with women of the Pittsburgh Afghan refugee community through her partnership with the Pittsburgh-based Community Refugee Resettlement Program. Over the course of many months, Molly kept hearing from the women about how important it was for them to be able to share their stories of home, family, Afghanistan, and the refugee experience with other Pittsburghers. These women were deeply tied to the rituals and practices of making and eating Afghani food and wanted in the long run to create a, a catering business in Pittsburgh that served food from their home country. Based on the women's stories, Molly wrote Karaki. Karaki is a multi-sensory theatrical experience that combines storytelling with the regional cuisines of Afghanistan. Molly worked with the women to select five actors who would tell their stories on stage. The dialogue emerged directly from Molly's interviews and conversations with the women. As the stories were uh, being shared with the audience, the women were backstage cooking and serving their own food. Seeing the actors, hearing the stories, smelling the food and finally tasting it was an incredible multi-sensory experience. Ultimately, Molly was able to support the women in getting the entrepreneurship and food service training they needed to open their own catering business, an LLC called Zafron Afghan Cuisine. 
Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to discuss the other two partnerships here that were part of this residency, but each one in their own way created platforms for members of their partnering organization, in one case, the United Somali Bantu of Greater Pittsburgh, and the other, the Bhutanese Communi Community Association of Pittsburgh, to write and share their stories of home and culture. The next project is our longest running artist residency, which is now in its sixth year. In 2014, OPA partnered with the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh in Hazelwood to launch an artist residency based in the Hazelwood community. Artist, artist Edith Abeda was selected through an open call and discovered through her engagement process that the most critical need in the community was a lack of connection to other parts of the city. The Greater Hazelwood community is predominantly African American and participants are intergenerational. Many have physical or intellectual disabilities. Like many other communities in Pittsburgh, Hazelwood was significantly impacted by the fall of the steel industry in Pittsburgh in the late 20th century. Over the years, the neighborhood has seen itself cut off from the city by the contraction of public bus routes, construction of highway infrastructure, and disinvestment. Edith listened to these needs and developed Arts Excursions Unlimited, an arts-based excursion program dedicated to increasing the cultural connectivity of Hazelwood residents. Uh, AEU annually serves over 200 members of the greater Hazelwood community and has a robust planning team and participant core consisting of community residents that help plan excursions and arts to arts institutions and events across the city and pre-COVID even to other cities. AEU has also spurred the creation of a neighborhood design team that undertakes public art and beautification projects called the United, United Hazelwood Design Team, such as this mural on the Elizabeth Street Bridge right in the heart of the Hazelwood community. All right, moving away from our residencies for the moment, I wanted to talk about our environment, health, and public art initiative. In this program, we sought to partner three environmental health organizations with three artists to collaboratively develop a work of temporary public art that would further advocacy and activism on environmental health issues in the Pittsburgh region, with a particular focus on impacts to at-risk and susceptible populations. Through our process, we selected these three organizations who chose to focus on issues from lead and soil toxicity to watershed health and air pollution. Again, through an open call process, the organizational partners chose these three artists who have been working to create three works of temporary public art that address the specific issue chosen by their organization. Now, as you may have noticed, many of our initiatives and programs consist of a cohort of organizations and artists who move through the process together. We can't overstate the impact of this cohort-based approach. Not only does it give us a chance to provide resources and opportunities to multiple organizations and artists, but it also creates an integral space for shared learning. Now, as with all of our cohort-based projects, a staff person is assigned as a project manager for each partnership. And I've had the pleasure of working this past year and a half with Ginger in the Nan Mal Run and CCA organizations. Both of these organizations partnered up in their application to the program because they're located in the Pittsburgh neighborhood of Wilkinsburg and wanted to address the community's connected issues of water and air pollution. Over the course of Ginger's interviews, meetings, and research, she kept being drawn back to the Nine Mile Run Waterway, which passes below Wilkinsburg in a culvert and eventually empties into the Monongahela River, one of Pittsburgh's three major waterways. Along its length, the health of the run and the ecologies that surround it have been endangered by combined sewage overflow, inadequate drainage, and dumping of industrial and chemical pollutants. Ginger developed Nine Mile Run Viewfinder to bring attention to the connections between the run, stormwater and sewer systems, the Monongahela River, and the water we drink, and advocates for a healthy regional watershed. This artwork consists of an artist edition of three manhole covers that will replace three existing storm sewer covers that provide access along the length of Nine Mile Run. Closely set gaps in the metal grating allow the viewer to hear and smell the stream, while hydro-powered lighting connected to the underground flow powers light to the bottom of the culvert. So the artwork is essentially a series of portals for hearing, seeing, and smelling the waterway beneath our feet and builds awareness of how the community is connected to the Mon River and the larger watershed. 
So when it launches this spring, it'll be paired with several online resources, including a video, an artist map, and several scores Ginger has written to provide a context and a self-guided experience at each of the three sites. I wanna shift here to a slightly different set of projects. Unlike all the projects you've seen thus far, none of the next three began with a call for organizations. In certain circumstances, we move forward with the project concept because it aligns because it aligns with our mission, vision, and guiding principles to such an extent that we adjust our process and structure in order to support its realization. This was absolutely the case for the There Are Black People in the Future artwork in residence, which we launched in 2019. This project was a close partnership with the artist Alicia Wormsley and was developed in response to the removal of Alicia's artwork titled, There Are Black People in the Future from a billboard without her consent in March, 2018. This is an ongoing body of work that Alicia, a black artist herself, began developing almost 10 years ago in 2012. In February, 2018, she was invited by the artist John Rubin to display this artwork as part of John's The Last Billboard project, which was a 36 foot long billboard on top of a building in the Pittsburgh neighborhood of East Liberty that featured a rotating selection of artist work. Within a month of going up, Alicia's text was removed without her consent by the building owner who cited reports of developer complaints. There were significant protests from community members in East Liberty, most of whom are black and already fighting against large scale displacement forced by East Liberty's rapid gentrification. So the artwork's removal and outcry of strong community support received a lot of attention in local and national media. And although Alicia was later invited to reinstall the work, she chose not to. Instead, she partnered with us at the Office of Public Art, as well as with John Rubin, to develop this concept for an artwork in residence, which, to my knowledge, is the first of its kind. This residency placed Alicia's text in residence with 11 artists and educators living or working in the five Pittsburgh neighborhoods closest to the billboard's original location. The goal was to support them in exploring the relevance and meaning of Alicia's text in their own practice. We launched the residency the following January 2019 with an open call for artists who were asked to submit brief proposals on how they would engage Alicia's text. The selected awardees were given micro grants of $1,200 and were supported by Alicia, John, and OPA over the course of the following nine months as they worked to realize their proposals. The awardees creatively incorporated the text into work that spanned visual and literary arts, musical performance, and innovative pedagogy, and launched public programming that engaged community members in conversation about the text's ongoing resonance. You can read more about each awardee's final project on our website or Alicia's at thereareblackpeopleinthefuture.com. Similar to our public art and communities program I showed earlier, the next program is a direct response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As soon as we realized the immediate impact of the pandemic, we marshaled our own internal resources to develop and implement the Artist Bridging Social Distance in the Public Realm initiative. The goal of this program was to pay artists to respond to this global event that's impacting them and their communities and generate a rapid response to the crisis. ABSD, as we call it, sought to support artists at this time of critical need when social distancing was causing widespread isolation and creative projects were being canceled or indefinitely postponed. We launched this article, this artist call on March 30th, 2020, actually two days before the stay at home orders came through for the state of PA. In early May, these three artists and teams were selected for the project by a group of independent Pittsburgh based arts professionals. And their projects responded to the pandemic by offering new ways of bridging social distance while also following guidelines for public health and safety. Over the summer, we worked with them, helping with project development, implementation, and outreach, and launching the projects in June and July. Black Dream Escape is a collaboration between artists and rest doulas, Annika Rains and Windafire. Together, they produce Black Rest Thought Pathways, an online video series dedicated to Black and Indigenous rest practices. Each 30 to 40, 45 minute session was uploaded to YouTube every week over the course of June, 2020. Deb Monte created one last thing, a correspondence-based public art project. This project gave Pittsburghers an opportunity to submit a postcard on which they could write one thing they regretted not saying or doing for a loved one before the crisis. Deb then scanned and presented the responses on our website, creating a mini archive of COVID-19 emotions. 
Sculpture Support System, an artist team by Sean, Mas uh, Sean Derry and Sharon Massey created the Quarantine Companion. This participatory art project involved kits that included needle, thread, googly eyes, and instructions on how to create your own companion using leftover fabric and other scraps. You could pick up a kit for free at three different toy vending machine locations or by requesting one online and having it delivered to you through the mail. Like Deb, they collected users' images and presented them online, creating a virtual art gallery of companions and community in this digital space. When we created the ABSD initiative, we were aware that the COVID-19 pandemic was going to be an evolving crisis and that our response to the crisis would need to similarly evolve. Our newest call, BIPOC Artists Bridging Social Distance in the Public Realm, is a reflection of that goal. We know that data reported since the early stages of the pandemic has made it clear that Black and Indigenous communities and communities of color are among those at greatest risk from both the virus itself and the impacts of the social distancing required to control its spread. Moreover, civil rights protests against police brutality, the continued and traumatic murder of Black people, and waves of xenophobia against those of Asian American descent have only intensified the need to amplify the voices of artists from these communities. With this in mind, BABSD builds on the original initiative, responding not only to the ongoing pandemic, but also its disproportionate effects on people who identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color. These three artists were recently selected by a panel of BIPOC arts professionals and community members to launch their proposed projects this spring and summer, along with four additional BIPOC artists whose projects will launch later this year. The scope of the projects in this cohort range from the intimate act of letter writing between Black mothers across the United States to honoring Chinese ancestors in a graveside ritual and hosting an online showcase and sale of artwork by Pittsburgh-based Black artists. Now this is the last project I'm going to show and I wanted to include it here because it's one of our most current residencies, but one like the previous two that follows a slightly different trajectory. After the conclusion of the There Are Black People in the Future artwork in residence, Alicia Wormsley approached OPA about partnering with her on a new artist residency program she was developing specifically to support black mothers who identify as artists, creatives, or activists in Pittsburgh. Called Sybil Shrine, the project is an homage to the Sybils, the original priestesses of the black goddess Mami Wata. The term, which predates Greek history, was used to name the guardians of the matriarchy. The Sybil Shrine Residency Program is motivated by a similar goal, uplifting Black mothers with opportunities for self-care, childcare, space, and support in an effort to further develop their craft and their presence in the art world. For these women, the challenges of parenting in combination with systemic racism and sexism are daunting and make the barriers to a career in the arts almost insurmountable. Now, I hope over the course of this roundtable, I've given you a sense of the many different ways that civically engaged public art can support the people and residents of a community, amplify stories of place, home, and neighborhood, and challenge existing histories by lifting up marginalized or unheard stories and creating a platform for collective memory. Through a carefully considered, structured, yet dynamic process, we strive to support every artist with whom we work in finding true collaboration with the communities with whom they're partnered. And with that, I'd like to thank you all and offer to answer any questions you might have. Dietrich or Sheila, did you want me to? Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come in from the audience, unless one of you wanted to had a thought first. No, that's great. Go ahead. I think go ahead, Marissa. Thank okay, you. great, great, great. We've got. Um, Two, let me just find um, Fran and I can unmute you, Fran. But Divya, thank you. I'm taking a lot of notes. I actually have gotten direct messages from colleagues who are saying the same thing and already asking if this is going to be recorded. Um, and I think the intentionality of these projects, the deep thinking about how to pair artists and organizations from the start, so this work is really co-created, um, is I think really resonating with a lot of people here. Thank yeah, you, just, thank you so much. Exactly, I second that. I kept kept uh, seeing myself smiling through the whole thing because one project after another was just so delightful and powerful and impactful. And I think at the John Nicholas Brown Center, we'll uh, learn a lot from these and obviously hopefully stay in touch with you. as we Absolutely, move yes. Thank you so much, both of you for your very kind uh, remarks. Yeah. 
Um, okay, Fran, you should be able to ask your question now. Sorry about that. Thank you. I just want to say my heart is just like so full looking at all of this programming. It just, I literally like feel like I got misty a few times. It's just really beautiful and really world-class, incredibly beautiful work. Um, Thank you. Uh, just a little kind of question for me is when we work in place, there's always this question of, you know, how many local or regional artists we select versus international or national artists. And so I'm curious about kind of process that you go through in honoring both of those spaces. That's a really great question. And that's a conversation that we do have uh, frequently. Our, our thought is that we want other cities in this country to hire Pittsburgh based artists. So alternately, we want to support artists from other cities to come to Pittsburgh. Now it, most of our artist calls are open to you know anyone in the country. Um, I don't think we've had any international applicants yet. But a couple projects like Artists Bridging Social Distance were specifically for artists in the region. So we did we did contract that one, but most of them are, are open. And then it's up to the community organizations and our, our temporary public art and placemaking program, although and Jamie and John were um, Pittsburghers, Pittsburgh based artists, there were two artists not based in Pittsburgh who ended up being selected by their organizations and did a fantastic job. Awesome, thank you. Um, we've also got a question from Laura Kenny, who said that um, she's not able to unmute where she is right now, but she is a staff member at Brown and an undergrad alumna. And her question was, how would you articulate the role of art and public art in particular within a broader landscape of civic action and activism? Wow, we believe that art, I, I'll just speak personally, I believe that art is so integral in this landscape of civic action, especially the urgent civic action that we're in in this moment, not only from the pandemic, but the intersecting crises of racism and xenophobia. Um, and they're not new crises, <laughs> but we're in this, this time right now that I think more people are paying attention. And from, from what I've seen that artists have this incredible capacity to be catalysts for this type of action. When the pairing is right, when the collaboration is the collaboration is appropriate and, and voices are being uplifted and heard, I think art has a way of connecting with these issues in a lot of way that white papers and newspapers and media articles might not. There's this, there's this integral connection. I think something almost visceral within us that responds to art um, that that kind of that transcends linear narratives, it, it transcends the written word, it, it transcends, transcends time-based narrative, it's, it's experiential. And that is the unique role that I think that art and more specifically artists who are engaged in these practices can, can help us get to. And it, it's, it's like, I don't think there's anything that can substitute for that. Yeah, Sheila, did you have a question? I do, yeah. First of all, um, again, Divya, thank you so much. This was truly inspiring, and I don't often say that about a <laughs> uh, public lecture, um, but the ways in which you have managed to mobilize so many diverse, and I mean diverse in a number of ways, partners from environmental and health uh, and uh, history and archaeology even of these communities. My question is, um, some of these seem so fruitful and ongoing that I was particularly struck by the storytelling of seniors groups. Mm -hmm. um, how do you weigh the needs of these ongoing communities that you've fostered and, and built in many ways with the needs for new to bring new artists in and new projects? That must be a, a kind of wrenching thing it to is. decide over. <laughs> and that is also a conversation that we frequently engage in because you're absolutely right. It's when when you see like a, a what a you know an eighteen month or two year initiative bear such incredible fruit, you don't just you know want to shut the door and say okay we're done bye see you later. So there's this, um, but, but on the other hand, if we continue engaging with those collaborations, we only have a staff of five, and so our capacity is severely curtailed to engage in new initiatives. So for the Larmer. Um, uh, residency that's continued that John, we helped John find exist, uh, additional funding for, as well as Arts Excursions Unlimited, which as I mentioned is in its sixth year, 
that has all been conversations with artists um, who have a really compelling project idea and maybe even ideas for where funding can be found and then helping them get that funding. But something that we've learned even doing that is that there's certain things that OPA provides that, that we can't just stop providing without helping the artist build a plan about what can replace that. So now we have in our process that about 12 months in, we slowly start to open the conversation about an exit strategy, which isn't a, okay, in 12 months, we're not gonna to talk to you anymore, but what are the kinds of support that OPA is providing you that you think you might still need at the end of 12 months? What, might, what other ways or strategies can we help you find that support so that you can launch your project on your own? Because ideally we wanna build capacity for these artists and organizations to then do this work on their own. I think that's, that's a true measure of success for us is that in order to build the public art ecosystem in the region, we want to build these capabilities and these capacities in the people with whom we're working. So I don't have like a, a specific list of, of things, but it's something that we're really grappling with and committed to, to helping um, artists figure out, which is probably the way it should be. I mean, each project is gonna be so different in its needs that there isn't a single list. It's, it's gonna vary depending on the artist and on the neighborhood and on the collaboration. Great, great, thank you. Terrific, I think Micah is up next, if you can voice it. Yeah, good. Everyone, okay, great. Um, Divya, this is fantastic work. I'm an arts administrator in the city of Providence and we have a very young public art program, but we're really experimental and, and always looking to other um, cities that have great models. So you guys certainly, your region, your, your public private mix here, it's such an amazing model. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that a, approximately two year time horizon for the civically engaged public art process and sort of when and how you provide material support for community partners, for artists, and for um, community stakeholders who are a part of that work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so, I mean, the most the most tangible resource is the, the monetary support because we firmly, firmly believe that no work is free, that art labor is labor. It is real labor and artists should not feel like they that it's an honor to work on a project but not be paid, you know, no, it's an honor for us to be working with this artist. So we need to pay them a real living wage. And so we base our time frames based on the amount of money that we have. For our artist residencies, they're the ones that we have the most funding for, which is how we can support artists to actually engage for a full year of engagement. They're like part-time, they're part-time salaried staff members almost of that organization at that point. But the way we set it up is that for the organizations, um, depending on the program, they get between five and $10,000 to support their participation in the initiative. And the artists, I'm gonna use the, the public art and communities program as an example. Those, um, those programs are roughly funded between 30 and $40,000. I don't have the exact number in my head right now. And that includes the artist fee. So we always say the artist fee is 20% of the total budget. And they get a certain amount upon signing they get another amount when they submit their conceptual design proposal, another amount when their final design is accepted, and another amount when the artwork is complete. And sometimes we have to have a final amount when the artwork is deinstalled. That's the final thing. So those are, are deeply or intricately connected to the, the milestones um, that the artist has to meet. And then similarly with the organization, there's a certain amount at signing, a certain amount when they approve the final design, and then a certain amount when the when the artwork is complete. So um, it's important that they get paid all along the way. And we're right there with them, helping them figuring out the budget and um, any, there isn't a single one that we've done that hasn't had challenges. And that's where the individual project manager comes into play. And sometimes that's budget related. And so we help them figure that out. I hope that answers. Resources are so much more than money, but that's the first one. It's like, we have to pay people. So, and it's the ongoing support of the project manager. Um, we have cohort meetings. That's a really important resource that's not monetary that the cohort of artists and organizations pre-COVID met in person every quarter. So they give updates, share challenges, show progress. Um, and often we found that they were meeting on their own because they were just comparing stories and, 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 and sharing knowledge. So that's a critical thing. We found that the cohort 
support creating that model is, you know, like I said, I can't overstate the impact of that. Thank you. Um, Nancy, I think you're next. Hi. Oh. Hi, Divya. Um, Hi. Nancy. I'm sorry, dog and dog. Um, quick question about um, since, you know, this is being sponsored and taking place at Brown. Um, have you had any experiences with like long-term partnerships with universities, um, you know, sort of similar to JNBC and how have those worked out? That's a really good question. Um, we, I mean, I think there's few places like the JNBC and other, other universities. It's a pretty unique um, setup, but we have, so most of our collaborations are, you know, regional or local. And so we're most intimately connected with Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh. And so we, um, we haven't done any artist residencies or, or you know, inter integral connections with universities, but we're often, you know, speaking to art students, you know, helping them figure out the art landscape. What can OPA do for them? We worked with professors at the University of Pittsburgh to host a Monument Lab to come to Pittsburgh and talk about the incredible work that um, that Paul Farber is doing and is and Ken Lum and all the amazing people part of that initiative. And so it's it's more more like the arts ecosystem type of work that we're doing with universities, helping students, uh, partnering up with faculty that that the academic connections have come in. But uh, it's a there's so much opportunity there and the fact that history of art and architecture are brown and public humanities are so close together i mean it, that's just ripe for so many incredible things that have already happened and i'm sure will continue to happen um thanks i'm wondering um i've got a question which is that knowing a little bit about you know some of your academic background and how you've been thinking about this um within your scholarship and also through your practice i'm wondering how you think about the history of what were you know civically engaged public art? Um, where for you does it begin? Where where are the moments in time where we see like right now it really feels like it's front and center, and there there are spans of decades where it does feel like it becomes very integral to the conversations we're having as a as a as communities or as a country. Um, so I'm just wondering how you think about that that history and sort of how you place where we are now within that history? That's a really good question. I feel like that's a dissertation level question. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone out there, dissertation idea? Um, uh, so, and I haven't done extensive research on the history of civically engaged public art, though now I feel like I really want to, um, but the, the kind of, I don't wanna say lore, but the, the, the project that, that I always hearken back to, um, that almost launched this way of thinking was in the 1970s when um, Merle Eucalys uh, embedded herself in uh, the municipal department of the city of New York. And she created it, I think, as like a feminist uh, social practice work. And that then, I mean, not immediately, but eventually created the pair program, Public Artists in Residence at the city of New York, where public artists are paired with different uh, New York municipal departments, some sanitation, transportation, you mean communication across the board. And some really, really, and it's all it was all created to address a specific need that that city department had to fill. And it's a pretty impressive program. It's pretty incredible. Um, and it's a very similar thing. It's their extended engagements, time for collaboration, time for community listening. Um, and they're, you know, connecting back to the earlier question, how can art play a role? In many of those projects, the, you know, residents didn't trust city government for, for whatever reason. And it was through the artists building bridges and bringing people together and speaking a different language almost that, that critical civic action programs were realized. And so I think that that's, that's a really important part of the story and part of the history. Um, there are a lot, anyone who's interested in this, there are a lot of uh, artists in residence programs that are 
public in some way or the other. There, I think that some of the municipal residencies are some of the best examples. LA, um, San Francisco, St. Paul has one, Boston, um, that, that do have that civic component. Then there's some residencies in museums, which have public components, maybe slightly, slightly different. As we know, museum spaces are not necessarily public spaces. There's, there's barriers to entry there. And then there's residencies in parks, the National Parks Foundation, the National Arts and Parks Foundation also. And so there's a lot of different kind of, of ways that organizations and institutions are approaching this idea of civically engaged public art. Some is more engaged, some is, is kind of more studio practice that then just goes on view in public, which is not better or worse, it's just not civically engaged. And so that's typically what we think of when we think of you know, a sculpture that's always been there that just kind of appeared one day, uh, maybe decades ago. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but maybe there was no civic engagement or maybe there could have been. So I think that, I mean, I think what would be interesting to look more into is how have artists created this space for themselves? Because absenting the, the organizational structure, the OPA structure, the you know New York City structure, artists have been trying to do this for a very long time. And some of it just hasn't gotten attention. That's maybe part of the canon that that you know we can help fill out. So that's such a good question and something I'm really excited to kind of think more about. Thanks. Um, one other because I don't see I one other quick question then. Um, for you or for, for some of the projects you guys are doing, uh, is there a, or, or do you ever invite um, or encourage some kind of measurable structural change that happens in the course of the artistic research and production? Or is that something that is never really part of the um, process? Oh boy, evaluation, it, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about evaluation. As soon as you say measurable change, it is integrally connected. Um, there's different ways that we approach it. And it's actually, we're, we've been talking about this a lot with our public art and communities program because we do want to evaluate it, but evaluating the art is a different thing entirely. That's, I mean, that that's just a whole other kettle of fish. So, so what we're focusing on is, are we building capacity for artists and communities to then go on and do this themselves? That's, I think, like I mentioned, like that's our true measure of success. But then backing up, we were working with professional evaluators to help us figure this out because this is a very tricky and professional field that, I mean, none of us is our professional evaluators. So we try to carve out part of our budget for this. So it's stepping back and saying, what are the goals? They could be quantitative, they could be qualitative. How are you going to be measuring them? When are you going to be measuring them? How much are you paying people? Because you know information shouldn't be free. Um, and then in what ways can we then follow up with artists after the fact through surveys or anonymous um, feedback or even conversations to say, what worked for you? What support did OPA provide that, that helped? What, what more could we have done? And so depending on the project, the time frame, and the funding, we're working those evaluative questions and approaches into our projects across the board. And it's it's part of, like I talked about, you know, we mentioned that we try to figure out the exit strategy early on. We also figure out the evaluation approach early on because it can't be something that you only think about right at the end. Just like the exit strategy, you have to be thinking about it from the beginning. Thank you so much, Divya. This was wonderful. Uh, Sheila, did you want to um, add anything as we yes, just, I just shower you with our more. thanks? <laughs> I want to yes, just shower you with praise and thanks. Thank you so much, Divya, for taking the time out of your very busy schedule um, and for bringing these uh, just inspiring uh, stories to all of us. We're going to be thinking about this for some time to come, I, I assure you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. It really, I really has been such an honor to be back and, and see some some familiar faces and reminisce about my time at Brown. And if anyone has any other questions that they want to ask later, please feel free to email me. It's on the screen. And um, I look forward to hopefully, you know, being in touch and hearing how things are going.
Terrific. We'll get you back for real as soon as we can. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you. you.